Hello and welcome to the Practical Creative Podcast, where I talk to people who are out there actively making and doing creative work. I want to know more about their materials, their processes, and what it is that motivates or inspires them to keep creating. And along the way, I'm also learning more about the nature of creativity itself. I'm Jeremiah Craigie, and in this episode, I'll be talking with contemporary tapestry weaver Joe Barker. If you are at all interested in the creative process or in challenging your own practice, then there's something here for you. Joe produces absolutely stunning work that is it's a million miles from traditional tapestry. Her work almost vibrates with color and intensity. If you were to take a Rothko and Albert Irvin and put them in a blender and then turn the color up to 11, you'd be getting close to what Joe does. In this episode, we really get stuck into her process and talk about sources of inspiration, generating and exploring ideas, and the importance of selection and editing in order to keep moving forward. We also have a frank conversation about why she isn't a business that I found really refreshing and inspiring. There's loads of fascinating insight in this episode, so please enjoy. So what we'll do then, I think, is we'll just start at the very beginning, which is, mm-hmm. could you tell us who you are and what you do? Okay. Um, I'm Jo Barker. Um, I kind of have two main things that I do. Uh, the main one is tapestry weaving. I'm a des- I design and make tapestries, and they're uh, mainly used for um, exhibitions and uh, sometimes for commissions. So people will approach me uh, and I'll make a piece for them. And then the other thing is that I teach um, at Glasgow School of Art. I teach first-year students in the Department of Fashion and Textiles. I mostly teach the textile students. Um, So I have quite a sort of split uh, working life. And the studio is the kind of very quiet focused one when it's working um, and then this, obviously the teaching is a, a much more busy um, involved life um, talking and thinking in a very different way from being in the studio. Are there things that you feel you get from having that strong contrast in interaction that solo time in the studio versus having to go and be much more interactive and have much more human contact? I think for me it's essential. I, I couldn't do either one all the time, and I think it each feeds the other. And I need um, a bit of hustle and bustle. Tapestry weaving obviously isn't hustle and bustle, but I also do need time on my own, definitely, um, in my life, and the studio gives me that. And I teach, uh, the sort of average age of the student I teach is probably about 19. Um, and so that's a very different world from being here in the studio. My actual, my studio is part of a big, um, a bigger building, a uh, complex of studios. Lots of towns and cities have these buildings now. Um, and so there are lots of other people in the building here working away, doing all, all kinds of things from um, sort of painting and ceramics and jewellery, um, printmaking, other tapestry weavers. Um, but we tend to, it is a workplace, so you don't um, overlap too much with each other. Um, so people, I think people think um, if you're in a studio with lots of other people, you're probably all you know, hanging out in each other's studios. Um, but it doesn't quite work that way. However, it's really good knowing there are other people in the building working in a similar sort of way. So I'm sort of with people in the studio, but not. Whereas when I'm teaching, it's obviously the opposite way around. It's all about them and, and helping them work on projects. And it just suits my personality to have these, these different ways of working. As you're in, a stu- in your studio, do you have a typical working day? And if you do in the studio, could you take us through it? Um, my studio life goes in phases. And um, when I'm designing, making uh, my images for the tapestries, it feels extremely different being in here uh, from when I'm weaving. And even when I'm weaving, there's different stages through that where you've got the design, you then scale that up and you gather the yarns and get everything ready. Um, So there isn't a typical day. There are sort of typical stages for me um, and they feel very different. So because tapestries take a long time to make, you need to make sure the design that you've come, well, I I feel the design I've come up with um, is the right one and is going to sustain me for those weeks that I'm making it. Um, So None of it's a rushed process. Um, However, the way I make my designs is all about capturing a moment. Um, I make painted marks 
um, in a range of different colours. And um, I'm just capturing an immediacy. So it looks as though the images have come about quite quickly, but it's usually over a few weeks. And then once I've decided on the design, you go into a sort of pre preparatory stage where I'm, as I say, uh, you put a warp on the loom, you make your design to the scale that you, you're going to weave it to. So normally my designs are under A4 sized but often I'm weaving them at, um, you know, a metre, metre and a half, something like that, even bigger. So the design, sh the shapes from the image need to be scaled up, put the warp on the loom, get the yarn colours out and um, then start weaving. And then it's got to be a really, really focused um, way of working for quite a few weeks. And that's not always easy to maintain that focus. So um, within all of that, there isn't a typical day. But once I'm weaving, it's about trying to get in and do a full day's work. You've got to get in um, relatively early to get the focus, to keep weaving for the day. Um, so mm, nothing's particularly typical, but there are rhythms through the year, I suppose. And are there things that you do to help prepare you mentally or, or even you know, physical energy wise before going into the studio and is that different depending on what stage you're in the process i'm not conscious of doing anything to get me to that point because i'm I, I suppose i'm on a sort of conveyor belt while i'm going through all these various stages so um, i know what to expect um a day will be like but um i'm a better in the morning I know that about myself I'm more productive in the morning I have a lull in the mid, mid of the afternoon and I always stop around about six um I, I've never been somebody who's a night owl and works in the evenings at college there were lots of people like that um and I know in the building here there are people who prefer to work like that but um I guess uh I don't know whether I'm answering the question very well but um I like a nice breakfast <laughs> I like this thing um, <laughs> I'm driven, I'm quite excited. If, I'm, if I've got my design done and I'm excited to get weaving, that, that drives you, actually. That gets you in and you constantly queue. What's, today, what's it going to look like today when I've finished this amount of weaving? And um, So there's a kind of a little constant hunger there to see um, what's it going to look like, what's it going to look like. I think people think you're very patient when you're a tapestry weaver. And actually, um, I, I don't feel very patient. I'm, I'm, it is that hunger to see what's next, what's next. And, and what are the, the stages in, in your process? Um, so from making designs or when you're doing the weaving? Uh, let's start with making the designs. Yeah. Um, that's always the sort of... Uh, it, it, People always would love to have a nice crisp answer to what's your inspiration and where do you get your ideas from. And um, actually, <laughs> mine isn't... I don't make... Uh, sort of readable picture images I'm not telling a story and the images that I make are very much about I suppose sensations and they can be about the sensations of colours reacting um, or creating a mood of movement or of drift or of floating or sinking um, so what that comes from um, is always really hard to put my finger on but I, I've love being out in outdoors in nature looking at the way the light um affects things the so shadows and colors um in nature um so for example if you're out walking and you see a beautiful blob of lichen or um rocks you know with a lovely yellow blob on it or white um and uh, pools of water the way that the light affects a pool of water or even if it's a puddle or you're by a lock or something so i do like being outdoors i do take lots of photographs and often they're of little details in nature um so when we go out for a walk i'm often sort of lagging behind just looking at little combinations of maybe a, a blade of grass with a dark patch behind it or something. So I could generalise and say that my images come from nature. Um, but then my colours are very, very vivid and they're not necessarily colours that you find obviously in nature. So what I tend to do is then when I've made my... Um, I make painted marks on paper and I use... At the moment I've been using quink inks, like writing ink. So you get a beautiful dark, dark black dark inky blue um, but I've been painting I've been using pastels really lovely pigment rich pastels 
just putting marks down first on the paper and then washing this ink and pooling the ink on top of it so you can get some really lovely surprises of the way that the ink interacts with the pastels. Um, and then I have a whole series of sheets of these. It depends on the kind of paper I work on, whether it's very absorbent or whether the, the ink sort of floats on top of the paper. Um, and then they all sit and dry and I scan those into the computer and then work with Photoshop to really play around with the colours a lot more and you can um, really push them in many directions. And that's when I just start to rely on instinct and waiting for colours that give me a sort of sense of excitement or um, interesting reactions. And I love the fact that I get surprised by that. It's sort of in my control and out of my control. And so I never quite know what's going to happen. And that gives me a sense of excitement. Um, so that's how this designing works. And I never really know how long it's going to take. It, it, it can be a moment of making some interesting marks um, or it can be, you know, two, three weeks of feeling I'm not, I'm not sure where I'm heading. And the way that I start the day is I usually go back to where something worked best last um, and pick up from the last thing. So this is what I mean about not having actual sort of, I'm not telling a story, I'm not working with... Um, a particular concept or an idea, but it's to, a sort of visual reaction. Um, so, so that's a sort of try, trying to explain how I do my designs. It's quite a difficult one to put into words, actually, when you work intuitively. Sure. I, yes, I completely understand that. So you're, you're working quite <laughs> intuitively in this initial process of, of making marks, and then you're, you're putting them into the computer and then going through yet another process of manipulation. And it, you had said that you have to, because of the length of time it takes to actually make a tapestry, you want to be confident that the image that you've decided yeah. on is the right image. How do you know when you've got there? Yeah, I know. It's that elusive, how do you know thing. It's like, when do you know to stop with something? Um, I always wait for a, I get this sense of excitement in my stomach. And I talk about this with the students because often when we do sort of reviews of work, we'll work in small groups. And invariably when somebody's showing their work and then we say, so what do you all like? What, what's everybody excited by? And often people will point to the same thing. And the student who's made those images doesn't necessarily know that, that that's the obvious screamingly good one, but everybody else does. And so I'll ask the student, but did you get a bit of excitement when you made that image or whatever it is that they're doing? And, and they did. And I said, trust that, recognize it, because that's, for me, it's the moment when you know that something is worth pursuing and probably has got something more about it than maybe the other designs. So it's, for me, it's learning to trust my instincts and, and know when I'm excited. I also often just ask other you know, friends in the studio, just show them two or three things and just see if I can get a response from them, a bit like that with the students. Um, and it often, it, well, that's the way it works for me. Brilliant. That's a fantastic answer. It, because it sounds like so much of what you're doing is on an, I don't want to say an unconscious level, but perhaps a subconscious level, that you're working yeah. outside of the intellectual and you're responding yeah. to things intuitively and emotionally. It is, and it took me a long time in my career to sort of feel confident to be able to say that because I always felt like, well, oh, it's not rooted in something, it doesn't tell a story, it's not necessarily conceptual, and I, I always found it hard at college as well. And then I began to think, well, it's still, it's working. People seem to, enough people have liked what I've done and you get feedback. So I, I started to feel like, well, okay, I don't work like other people, but this is the way I work, and, and then I've realize that, that that's all right. So yes, I do. I work quite um, in the subconscious. I think you're right. And that's why it is hard often to say, where does your inspiration come from? Because people do want a nice, um, simple sentence um, to be able to tell them what it's about. Um, but I've, I've grown more confident being able to talk about it in, in the way that I'm talking to you. Um, because, well, it's, it's what works for me. And do you feel uh, pressure or have you felt the pressure in the past to offer a conceptual argument or rationale for what you do? Yeah, you definitely, when I was a student, yeah, you needed to um, be able to discuss the ideas and push it and test it. And, um, you know, I, I did try working like that, but um, the way I feel most creatively fed is to work this way. 
Um, and as I say, I mean, I think once I started to put work into exhibitions and get feedback from people, it, it seemed to give other people something. So you just thought, well, okay, that, that's all right now. I can do that. But um, not everybody, yeah, we, we do all work. That's, that's why creativity is interesting. It is different for everybody. And going back to your process a little bit, I can see on the wall behind you, and mm -hmm. listeners can't, but I can see you've got loads of, you've got photographs, you've got bits of paper with, looks like a bit of ink wash, and um, I think there's something that looks like a, a frying pan, <laughs> um, all sorts of bits of yeah. pieces stuck with tape to the wall. Yeah. What What is that doing for you? It's a funny thing. It just becomes a habit. And I think, you know, especially if you've gone through art college, everybody does it. It's just um, having images around you that inspire you um, or that you find are intriguing. Um, and for me, they're a mixture. I mean, actually, <laughs> the frying pan thing, that's really funny from a distance. It's um, <laughs> from a Miles and Spencer's ready meal, separating out two layers of sauce and whatever else. It's a, pl a, circle, a plastic a a circle with holes pierced through it. And um, I just really like it. And I've got it placed on top of a piece of gridded paper that's a, a bag, a, a spotty paper and, and gridded paper from a shop. So I just quite like the design qualities of those things. But I've also got, I'm looking around, um, well, there are pictures that, that I take. I mean, actually, these images have been on the wall for quite a while now. Um, I don't move them around that frequently. So there's... Um, uh, an uncle lives um, further north. In the, I live in Scotland, and um, he's up near Oban and lives by a river. And we went up one new year, and the river was totally frozen. It was absolutely stunning. And the, the patterns in the ice and the way that the water freezes gradually, so you get these lovely curving ripple marks of from white down dark blues into black. I've got pictures of that, and we were skating. We were well, we were riding bicycles on the river and making fantastic tread marks, and you could see all the animal prints and the shadows of the trees on the riverbanks casting these lovely long soft shadows. So. These are all things that I have around me. And I think, again, this all adds into this kind of instinctive, subconscious uh, thing that I do with making images, that I don't look at those photographs and make paintings from them. They're around me. And these things just filter through. So a lot of those images are the photographs, and I've got some inky marks that I've been playing with, direct kind of brush marks or pools of ink or pools of watercolour. So this all acts as a sort of a visual wall that um, is a flavour, I suppose, of where your thinking is maybe at at a moment in time. Mine tends to stay, as I say, the same for quite a while. It's partly because my process is very slow. You know, I make don't make very many tapestries a year because they do take a long time to make. Um, so for me, it's I've lived with these images for quite a long time now. But that's fine. That suits me. A lot of other people might change them around more often. Is having a wall of images something that you do with the students as well? Yeah, they're absolutely it's essential. And uh, with them, it's a much quicker turnover um, because they're working on projects that last between two to four weeks tops. And as they're making the work, they don't have a huge amount of space to work in. So what we tend to do is we start off with a project with um, a theme and you do the drawings and the photography and then you start to develop those drawings into designs and they become sort of paper textile ideas. So at each stage after we do a sort of a review of where the work is at, we, we, we try and encourage them to edit the wall to just the most current essential pieces so that they can be always in the moment rather than they've still got the first drawings on the wall or the first photographs. So um, for them, it's a much more constant process of editing and moving forward. Um, it, it, it's also for me, it's just that my medium is a slow one and, and they're in a, obviously a learning environment where they need to keep moving forward all the time. But yeah, it's, it's, it, well, it's not only essential to have your, your work, developing work in front of you, but, um, everybody wants to do that. All of the, you know, in the studio where, where I teach, we have a very open studio. So we've got textiles, we've got fashion students, we've got communication design students, jewellery students, interior students. They all work in very different sort of ways, but all of them want to have work out in front of them while they're working. So it, it, it's, it's totally normal um, for us. 
Okay. So yep. I would ask you a totally different question. <laughs> Um, no, actually, I'm, I'm, re- <laughs> I'm jumping all over the place. Your process sounds, like, as I said, very intuitive. What is your view on play? Um, I kind of feel that what I do is quite playful in the designing stage because, as I say, I don't have a hugely conscious mind while I'm doing it. it there is an element of play. But there kind of are always points of um, decision making as well. So I have to allow for for flow, um, which to me does feel playful. But then you do, as I say, you've got this sort of um, yeah, this decision making point as well, so that it's sort of um, it's the editing as you go along. I'm trying to sort of think. <laughs> about play do you are you meaning maybe play when you're not in the studio when you're doing other things or is it about the work I I was thinking about the work because play play can often have negative connotations but I also feel that play can be a very serious Mm -hmm. process and something that is sometimes undervalued in the creative process. Yeah. yeah, 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 I agree. No, I think it is important because I think there's a, almost like a sweet point between letting go and being conscious of what you're doing. And I think it is very relevant, really, in the way that I kind of make my designs. Because um, sometimes things that just almost happen, they can happen without you noticing if you just let go a bit. Um but you only know that when you do the sort of the reckoning bit, you know, you've got all your things that I'm in my example is all these bits of marks. And then I sort of stop and look and think, OK, now I'm assessing where I'm at. But uh, if you, if I'm too conscious of what I'm doing, it becomes a little bit stilted. So um, I'm just wondering if the word playful is the right word. It's a sort of letting go. Along the lines of, of playfulness or, or uh, letting go. What do you do when you get stuck? Yeah, it's such an important thing, isn't it, about getting out of being stuck. It's something that, again, talking about with students is really uh, when we get to an end of a project, we get we ask them to sort of write a reflective um, sort of, you know, couple of paragraphs about the process to, to note the point when you were stuck. How did you get yourself out of that? Because if this is something that happens regularly, if you've got ways of doing that, that will really help you. And as ever with teaching, it's always easy to say it to other people and maybe not so much to recognize it in yourself. Um, What do I do to get out when being stuck? Sometimes it means walking away for a while and go for a walk, do something different, come back tomorrow. Um, For me, being stuck is... In, when I'm weaving, it's not a problem because it's uh, it's a very different process. It's a doing thing, and the, the reason to sort of stop if you're stuck is you just may be tired or you you're feeling stiff. But the design stage is definitely where you can have stuck moments. So one of mine is to go back to something that worked and then move on from that one, or like I say, go for a walk, do something else, have a cup of tea or something, go and talk to someone else in in the building, you know, see a, a friend. Take your mind out of it for a moment and then come back. Um, sometimes it's do something, like you say, about being playful, um, which is uh, to sort of free yourself up a little bit. It depends what kind of thing you've got stuck with, I suppose. But um, there are sort of a few of my little sort of methods and techniques. Also, I do know now, I've been doing it long enough, that I will get unstuck. It will be all right in the end. I think with students, it's a different thing. They, they you know, it's, it's a more anxious thing because you can't imagine how you might get out of it. Um, but I've, I, I can trust it now. And because I, my stuff takes time, I know that, time will let it ease and and sort itself out too i would imagine not being anxious about it yeah helps yeah yeah definitely but that's always easier said than done isn't it (laughs) (laughs) it certainly is yeah (laughs) (laughs) your process sounds quite lengthy what is it that motivates you to keep coming back when so so many of us are involved in, in creative work that we don't really have to do. 
So what is it that keeps you coming back to the studio? I know it's a really good question. And especially with this bizarre thing, tapestry weaving, which is so contra, contrary or contradictory to kind of modern, modern worlds, modern lives where we obviously are, everything's much quicker. And, um, but that's probably one of the reasons why there is something really absorbing about making, well, for me, tapestries, but just very much about making things. I mean, I, I do, this is my kind of, um, my studio work and what I do professionally, but I, I do all other things as well. I knit and I sew and, and making things is, you, you're always looking to do the next thing and get a bit better at it and learn more about materials, learn more about the actual making process. Um, and so actually you, you don't ever tire of it. It's a curious thing. I mean, especially if you watched people weaving, you might think, my God, it's just so repetitive. You're just you know, picking up warps and you're feeding a bobbin through and bashing it down again. But it's a really curious um uh, you get this, like I say, it's a, you're driven and you want to see what it's going to look like and you don't always, you're not always hugely happy with everything that you make, but that unhappiness, that niggle is what pushes you to make the next one. Um, so it, it, you could, I could be accused of being the goldfish going round and around the bowl and here we go again, but um, there's a sort of constant, there's always something to question or try a bit differently and um, so many permutations that can be shifted and changed so it, it's a curiosity I think that just keeps you going and I quite like being good at something but also I, I really admire quite a few people there's people working in tapestry who do work that's um, uh, it's got right, say, rougher edges or uh, they work mm, in a very different way. I weave quite fine yarns and I see people working very thick, chunky yarns and think, oh, God, that, that's a whole different way of working. And maybe one day I'll, I'll have a go at trying that. So there's so many different ways of doing it. I think that keeps you going, too. So it seems that you are you're really driven by curiosity and a desire to learn and to see what's around the corner. Yeah, yeah, I think so. Yeah, just and also, <laughs> but it's also just that satisfaction in making something and seeing the results of just what your hands have done. It's actually, it, you know, it, it, it fundamentally it's a very simple process. Um, weaving is just putting weft in and out of warps. It's so supremely simple, but you know, it, there's so much you can do with that. And my um, my weaving, you know, it's different from making lo fabrics on a loom. But that again, you know, fascinating subject and endless different permutations of structures you can do on loom weaving for fabrics. So um, through a very simple process, you can make very complex things, and I love that. It sounds incredibly satisfying and rewarding. Yeah, it is to me, and that's why I'm still doing it. Um, but it isn't for everybody. I mean, it, it, um, I haven't taught tapestry weaving for, for a very long time, um, but when I did, um, you can tell really quickly whether somebody um, has got an aptitude and whether they uh, you know, uh, uh, want to pursue it. It's a really quite a quick thing to, to, to notice and, you, and for the students to respond as well. Um, some people just get so drawn into it and, and you just think, yep, you've got it. And others, oh, my gosh, they just want to run away from it, throw the loom, you know, across the, <laughs> the room. So um, <clears throat> it's either for you or it's not for you, I think. So it was it was for you from a from really the very beginning. Right away, yeah. For me, um, I was really lucky. Well, I had a I was lucky at school. I had a really nice art teacher. I got great um, teaching in drawing, and I also loved making things. So I made things at home. Uh, when I got to art school, I was really lucky. A tapestry weaver called Lynn Curran came and did a workshop. Um, with us and for me it was the perfect combination of drawing painting and making all coming together and colour. She arrived with all these beautiful hanks of fantastic coloured yarns um, and it was just like these sort of everything's come together this is great I love it so yeah I was definitely a instant one <laughs> yeah. Excellent and I know you have um, strong feelings or thoughts on drawing Mm -hmm. But I don't know what they are. Could you, <laughs> could you talk a bit about well, how, what, yeah. the, the importance of drawing? 
It's a huge subject, and I suppose I feel it's important partly because of my teaching role, um, because of the stage that the students are at, which is their first year in art school. And when we, um, when students apply for our course, our programme, we always look for evidence of drawing in their f- online folios that they um, send in, because it's it's about looking, it's about thinking, it's about having an attention span to stick with something for an amount of time. It's about make decision making. Drawing is often more about what you leave out than what you put in. Um, it, you know, we don't necessarily want to see photorealist drawings from students, but we want to see evidence that they can observe something, take something from that, and l- make marks and be curious about different types of media. So that's on the sort of the teaching side. It's it's so important to get for for making designs and ideas to have had some aspect of drawing in the process. It doesn't have to be um, the only thing that they do. Um, photography is just as important as drawing because you're being selective with your eye about what you're taking from the world around you Um, and for me in my own work um, I don't draw classically in the same way that I used to do when I was younger and I regret that I I miss in a way doing that but I draw in a different way now and it is about gathering um, information and interpreting that like I say at the moment my drawing takes the form of making these gesture remarks it's almost like handwriting an aspect of making a mark of a letter but I'm doing it with a brush with ink but it's exactly the same as if I'd used a pencil or a crayon or a piece of pastel or charcoal it's transferring a mark onto another surface um, and it, it is that thing in your early years, I mean, we all did it as children, um, to about looking, I think. It's about really observing the world around you, the objects, and um, translating that into something that can be very different when it's in a drawing than when it's a real object. Um, and my mind's starting to ramble around a bit now, so I hope I've kind of, there's enough in that. Yes, no, no, that's fine. Yeah, the, the reason I'm asking is that there's a sense that a, an artist has to be able to draw. <laughs> yeah. So I, I'd be curious to know what your feelings are on that. I mean, again, it it doesn't have to be about classical drawing in the way that we m- maybe people think of, you know, like I say, sort of making it look exactly like the object in front of you. But um, I mean, sometimes it's drawings that are very far from that that, that become the, the most exciting. Um, but it's about the hand and the eye and the brain and thinking all coming together at the same time. And it, it gets you into a very focused place. Um, and that drawing can then be used for many other purposes after that. So it, it can sometimes just be to convey a piece of information. Um, it can be to describe something. It can be a thing in its own right. Um, the way that I work and also the way the students I teach work, it's a stepping stone along the way. Um, but I still get really a, a lot of satisfaction and pleasure out of, say, going to an exhibition and seeing drawings in an exhibition or seeing, you know, some of the old master's drawings. You just sort of think that's absolutely their hand describing something. And it's a really difficult thing to do as well, drawing. It's such a discipline. And um, I admire people who still put a lot of time into drawing. However, I know at art schools that people criticise art schools for sort of um, saying they don't teach drawing anymore. I mean, we, we do. It may not be in the classical way of drawing uh, plaster, uh, uh, you know, uh, marble carvings and um, copying other people's drawings, but it absolutely underpins everything that certainly we do on our course. And I think if you talk to quite a few people who teach in art schools, they would still say it's, it's there. It just may not look like... Um, the kind of drawing that some people think of as drawings. And that's where it gets exciting as well. It's when it's challenging what drawing is. That's interesting. So could you describe what a, a, a drawing that, that is challenging would look like or cha- a drawing that isn't traditional? I suppose maybe it's not using traditional material. I mean, I would consider, say, a collage 
is a drawing. So collage is where you chop up other materials and stick them down and make an image or a pattern or something. But it's again, it's that thing of transferring shapes and marks onto another surface to describe something. Um, and I think, if, like I said, I think taking a photograph could almost, depending on what you're going to do with it, could almost be described as a drawing because it's about information. And um, we all take photographs differently and we see the world. It's actually quite interesting seeing how differently we all look at the same objects. If people go out and do a project, like we've just done one, we're doing one about um, the buildings in the, the art school campus buildings. The students are to, t to do, uh, take photographs and do drawings from them to use those for their project work. And they've all looked at the same buildings and their drawings are all different. And even the way they've photographed the buildings um, can be different, what details they notice, what compositions they make. Composition is really important. That's a huge part of drawing is the way you arrange the shapes on, on the surface. Um, so you could use, you know, wire could make a three-dimensional drawing. It doesn't have to be flat and two-dimensional. Um, any linear material um, arranged in a composition you might describe as a drawing because it's a, an idea that's being conveyed. Um, it's always really hard talking about visuals, <laughs> using words and not showing visuals. Um, this is quite challenging in itself, actually. Um, You're doing a, a, a fantastic job. I think it's interesting, um, particularly about drawing, because it, it's often seen by people as the, defi the definition of an artist or a precursor to becoming yeah. an artist and that if you can't draw and I think this comes from traditional education that you if you can't draw yeah. you can't get into the next level yeah. of, of art class at school but um, I, th I think it's probably based on a very traditional concept of drawing yeah. and I think it's interesting particularly the way that you're describing it the, of challenging what a drawing is so that it might potentially even encompass photography or something sculptural made out of wire and what's particularly interesting to me is that that's a creative interpretation of drawing and that if that we we are all creative so why are we buying into a, a very rigid definition of what drawing is I agree. when we could be creative and challenge that and explode it i do i think um we're all creative. We're human beings. We're, we're, we are. And it's such a shame that that classic thing can happen at school, that you do get squashed. Um, and I'd, with a bit more encouragement, I think more people would, would keep it going. I mean, if you think back to, you know, God, 100, 200 years ago when, you know, no telly or whatever, um, many, many more people drew and painted and uh, men and women, um, all ages, we're human beings. We've got hands. We've got brains. We can do this. And uh, our sort of fairly rigid um, school art education, it, it does squash a lot. And that is that is a sad thing. Um, it's more about, I suppose, if the person wants to do it, um, you've got to have the, the interest in it. And I think a lot of people maybe lose the interest. Most children draw. And gradually you, you get distracted by other things, but some of us keep on going with it. Um, colouring in is drawing, really. You know, I mean, that's been a bit of a thing recently, but um, most ch children did colouring in. That's making marks. Um, develop that further and it becomes something else. So I think having the desire to do it, actually, is probably a big part of it. And are there other skills that you feel are critical or that help to support creativity? I, th I think making things, using your hands, um, making anything. Um, it's about, it is curiosity about materials. It's curiosity about how things go together, fit together, look once you've put these things together. Um, making is a really rewarding thing to do. Um, I mean, in a way, cooking is a bit like that. You know, you're, you're bringing together lots of things um, to create something new. Loads of us cook. We have to eat, but um, lots of us pursue it to a kind of greater uh, degree. Um, that's a creative process. Um, so there's a lot of things that we all do that we might not think of as being creative that are. That, that's great, because I, a question that I've been asking guests on the podcast has been, do you feel that everyone is or can be creative? 
I, I, I kind of do think that. I mean, I am obviously sort of being very optimistic by saying that, but it does need to be backed up by someone having that kind of the curiosity and that um, the desire to do it. And I know not everybody has that, but um, I, I just think it is a very innate thing within human beings to, to be creative. It's just maybe whether you've been um, exposed to things when you're younger or encouraged or not. Um, I was lucky that I was encouraged. I mean, my parents were not particularly creative in an obvious way, um, but they definitely had creative aspects to their life and, and encouraged me. So that that's a big part for me, I think, is that encouragement. Mm. And if I were to bring you someone who didn't have that encouragement, mm. uh, who, who perceived themselves as being uncreative or non-creative is there anything that you could do or ask them to is there a question you could ask them or a challenge you could give them that would potentially alter or encourage them to challenge that perception i suppose you would just need to talk to them and find out what kind of things in life they're interested in and then see if there's a way of bringing something into that interest that that could encourage that for me, the, you know, this interest in the hand and, and materials. So it would be a matter of talking to somebody and finding out, yeah, what they're interested in. Um, hmm. I'm sure there's a way that you could help somebody. Um, it's then whether they would enjoy the sort of the process and the results that they get enough to think, right, I might take this a bit further. Um, that would be the next step on from that. You've got to stick with these things. That's the thing, I suppose a lot of creative people have is that sticking with it thing. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and, and why do you think that is? Why do you think people have difficulty sticking with things? Hmm. Well, I know that you would give up on something if you didn't feel happy with the results or you weren't happy with the way that, that, that you were making something. I mean, I'm lucky I found the medium I like working in and the way that it pushes and stretches me. Um, I, I would not be somebody to work in wood or hard materials. Um, that d doesn't work for me. Um, I was lucky I did a foundation course where you get to try out lots of different um, areas. Um, and definitely I was much more in the textiles um, sort of zone. Um, oh, I forgot what the question was. That's really bad. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 it's fine. I was just asking. It, it, it's... <laughs> It's not the best question. It's just what it is that that in, prevents people from seeing something through. Yeah, S sticking with something. I oh, know. You do, I've, again, talking about the students, often you do have to sort of emphasize that with them. Look, it's going to take time. You know, you, you do have to stick with these things. You, that often they'll say, oh, this drawing took me, oh, it took so long to do. And how long was that? Half an hour. Well, <laughs> Uh, there's different ways of looking at what takes a long time to do. Um, mm. I think if they get, if you get an element of that, a little, it's like a, you're chasing things all the time. So if you, even if you get a nugget of it, you just think, okay, the next time it's going to be a bit better, and next one, and the next one. So maybe there's a craving factor there. I don't know, but um, you, you do need to learn to stick with things, especially uh, like you say, either the thing about getting stuck or things just not looking the way you want it to. There's a really lovely Ira Glass um, video called Taste, which I often show students. And it's about the principle of, you know, you're really, you, you know, so I'm teaching 18, 17, 18, 19 year olds. You know, you, you, you arrive, you're really sophisticated. You've learned to see the world through pretty sophisticated eyes. You've got ideas. But when you start to make them, they just don't match up with the image you've got in your head or whatever. And you've just got to keep on going. And it's a really brilliant little video. And I try and show it to the students each year um, just as a sort of a way of encouraging them that everybody gets this. It's an, a normal creative process, but you just got to stick with it and keep on working through. So Google that. It's a really great little video. Excellent. A question I should have asked earlier is when you've, you've been through the initial... Sorry, this is going right back to your process at the beginning. Yeah. You've been through the period of generating ideas. You, you've made some sketches and drawings. You've collected photographs. And then you, you pause and reassess. Yeah. Yeah. What are the questions that you're asking yourself when you're looking at mm -hmm. 
that 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 body of work after a period of letting go or exploration? Yeah, that's a good question, and it's quite a hard one to answer. Um, again, it <clears throat> for me, it's often down to instinct of what works and what doesn't and that's how do I put that into words um, sometimes uh, the sort of small paintings I'm making are uh, very repetitious it's nudge 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 and so you then have to think well I've got six here which of these is doing something more interesting than the others um, so you would edit out the five that maybe aren't right um, but it's actually really hard to put it into words why those five didn't work and that one did so Oh, that's the, where the kind of intuitive, instinctive thing is really hard to put into words. Um, and does one one of those one of the six really stand out, or are are you really having to make hard decisions? Yeah, it varies. I mean, to choose the one. Yeah, sometimes it's obvious and sometimes it's not. Um, especially if there's sort of repetition, um, you've just got to. I mean, with all of this, I could just paint and paint for days and make marks for days and days and days and days and, and there just comes a practical point where you say come on stop there's something here make it work so um other you know i don't have all the time in the world so um it, it that imposes a sort of sense of stop and start um on the process but um it's an aesthetic judgment and i suppose aesthetics is a huge subject you know what works for one person doesn't work for another um so for me, yeah, it's also looking at them thinking, would that be interesting to weave? And some things might work better woven and some might be better just left as a small painting. But it's also that the making the painted marks is just one of the stages. As I say, I then scan them into the computer. And then, gosh, you know, with Photoshop, you could be making endless billions of permutations. So there's always there's a, a pragmatic, common sense point where you just say, right, make a decision now. There's enough here. Some of these work make make a decision so there's a mixture of pragmatics and intuition i suppose mm. and do you do anything with the the remainders for example there's a school of thought that you can maximize your business by trying to find off cuts or mm -hmm. uh yeah. waste materials that have a value in them mm -hmm. and i'm just curious wh whether you look at any of those pieces that that have that are going to be translated into a tapestry but may work as standalone yeah. works um, on their own merit i i i know yeah i absolutely understand that and get that and um it's interesting that you say the word business because what i do i don't see as a business i have to fill out a tax form hmrc see me as a business but HMRC, whatever it's called, um, but I don't feel I'm a business and um, I earn my money uh, from teaching and I can live off that. The tapestry is, uh, if I sell work, that's a bonus, that's great, but I, I don't approach this from that perspective because people have said that to me before. Oh, almost, you know, why do you bother weaving them there? They're finished pieces, these, these designs in their own right, sell those. But for me, it's all about the making and I love the making. The designing is a stepping stone and it's not enough for me just to leave it like that. And I just see them as their ideas and thoughts and they're like words that have just sort of floated away afterwards. They just, I put them in a sketchbook and they stay on the shelf. So I'm, <laughs> I'm a business person's worst sort of <laughs> um, prospect. You know, I just wouldn't want to, I'm not interested in that. <laughs> Great. <laughs> okay. Um, <laughs> that's fantastic. That's really honest. Because I think there, well, I know that there's there's often a tension between being a creative and creating work that is time and labor intensive and is of great meaning, emotional value or fulfills a purpose for the maker. But there's very often a tension between doing that and having to then sell yeah. the work yeah. and the, the pressures that come with that. And I'm curious to hear how different makers balance that yeah. but it sounds like the, the financial imperative isn't too great for you well 
because as I say, I, I do the teaching and I and I I don't just do the teaching for the money at all. I, I do it because I love that. Um, but I earn enough for my needs. I don't in terms of money, but I, I for my own needs. And um, to sell a tapestry is a nice extra bonus. It's nice that somebody loves it enough to want to invest in that. Um, but if I really wanted to make money out of being creative, I would do something very different from this. You know, it's not realistic as a way of earning a living at all um and i've always known that but i i live in a different kind of i i'm it's not all about the money for me life at all so um you know i don't have a rich husband i just don't crave lots of money i get, have enough to live off i live a modest lifestyle and quite a few people you might find that they are supported by a, a partner who's got a fairly healthy income um but um in other instances i mean i'm really lucky that i have my teaching job um there's not many of them around and i i've always loved doing it and um i really appreciate it so that's my lucky bit but i, I mean i work at it but um yeah there isn't any other kind of secret source of income I get pleasure from the the, the the intellectual challenge of the making and the, the doing. It's really nice, as I say, if somebody wants to buy it. But, yeah, it's not about the money. Um, I just, so I do have this thing that, you know, just because you make it doesn't mean to say it's good and, and somebody will want to buy it. Um, it. I think if you're designing things to make money, you come at it from a very different um, stand, starting point. You would analyse a market I guess, and and out there already, what would make a difference? And um, I, I just don't have that kind of brain at all. And and you mentioned people buying it. Do you find it hard to see one of your tapestries go when you spend so much time on it? No, the opposite. No. <laughs> I once I've made a piece, I don't really want to see it again. It's really strange. It's about the making for me. I, I'm, you know, it'll be in the studio for a short while after I finished it. But um, if if it's going for an exhibition, that's great. And if it's uh, once it's out of the studio, it takes on its own life, and um, it's someone else's, um, or it's it's creating something within an exhibition. But um, I don't feel at all sentimental about them or like I own them. It's a strange feeling, actually. Um, I, I can see them go very easily. It's, I'm on to the next one. I think it's because, as I said before, I don't tend to sort of linger in the past. I don't hang on to that thing, that object. It's, it's what's next for me. So, yeah, I can Wow, that's, <laughs> that's fantastic. Mm-hmm. It must be quite liberating. Yeah, definitely, yeah. So, Joe, I just have one more question for you. No, I have two questions. <laughs> I'm sorry. I've got two questions for you. Uh, the first one is, do you have a creative challenge for listeners? Um, so, obviously based around colour, which is my my driving force, um, we, we all have um, our own responses to colour, and that's what I think is fascinating about it. And we have favourite colours and ones we don't like, and maybe we can't even explain why that is. Um, but it's always interesting to see what colours people will select, maybe as a palette of colours to work with to make designs, or even just colours that you wear or colours that you have in your life, in your home. So um, one exercise that we do with our students, which really helps you look at the world as well, is just to take a photograph which contains a range of different colours and tones that you like, perhaps. Maybe take one that you don't like as well. Um, but <clears throat> to, uh, if, you, if you've got access to paints, um, to try and match as many of those colours in that photograph. And that in itself is a really difficult, tricky task to do, to mix paint, to match the colours. And then cut those out into little sort of strips and stripes and, and stick them down in, in sort of like a vertical ladder. Well, you don't have to stick them down, actually, at first. Leave them movable. And so your photo is now a series of stripes. They can be the same width or they can be varying widths. And then start moving them around and playing with them and seeing how they work next to each other, what works in your eyes and what doesn't work and maybe take a few out and rearrange the ones you've taken out are they the ones you don't like can they work 
in a different combination once they've been taken out. And just notice what we want students to do is not have any white in the mix, in the, in the stripes, unless there's white in, in your photograph, um, because it's about um, relationships of colours next to each other. Um, and as I say, we, we all have... Uh, uh, colours we favour and those we don't but sometimes it's quite good to try and make a colour that you don't necessarily like can you make it work being next to another colour so that that's one version of a, a challenge I suppose um, that's yeah. fantastic that's, and mm. very, very clear <laughs> oh. <laughs> Joe, if people want to find out more about you, you and your work online where would they need to go? Um, I have a website um, Joe Barker Tapestry dot co dot uk and also um i it's similar images but i'm on the crafts council's um online um i don't know what they call it a list of makers i think it might be so i think if you google my name some things will pop up but um they're the main places Wow. Okay. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Joe. This has been brilliant. And thank you, Jeremiah. It's been really interesting talking to you, honestly. Thank you. Hey there. Thanks for taking the time to listen to this episode of The Practical Creative. If you'd like to learn more about Joe and her work, you can visit the Practical Creative website at thepracticalcreative.life, where you'll find images of her work and links to other material. And if you'd like to have a go at Joe's Creative Challenge, you can find a written version on the Creative Challenge page. Just head on over to the website and check it out. If <laughs> and if you've enjoyed this episode of the Practical Creative Podcast, it would be great if you would subscribe to the show, leave a review, or follow me on Instagram, at Practical Creative. Also, just really quickly, if you're interested in ceramics or makers with an uncompromising approach to their work, then check out my Q&A with Gareth Mason. Gareth is a ceramicist working with a highly distinctive and powerful visual language that challenges the limits of both the clay and the audience in equal measure. You can find it over on the Practical Creative website. Mm -hmm.